You're listening to Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Bob Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Well, tonight we are introducing the subject of our ancestors. The book is Communing with the Ancestors. This book demonstrates how to communicate and make contact with ancestral spirits, including practical methods for seeking their guidance. Raven, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, Gramasi, is that, yeah, I think I got it right. Gramasi explores the realm of the ancestors and the role of reincarnation in the soul's relationship to ancestral lineage. He explains the interactions between ancestors, the living and the dead, and examines how communication with the ancestors is strengthened through various techniques and ritual practices. Raven Grimaldi is a neo-pagan scholar, an award-winning author of more than 12 books on witchcraft, Wicca, and neo-paganism. He is a member of the American Folklore Society and is co-founder and co-director of Crossroads Fellowship, a modern mystery school tradition. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Raven. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. That's, that's a very old bio you have there. Oh, yes, I got it off your book. I really? Mean, yeah, sure. Right, that's the, the, wow. P, the PR. I'd, I'd have to double check that. That's that's strange. But yeah, I know uh, the fellowship um, of the Crossroads is, a, is no longer in existence. We're right now actually under House of Gramasi. Yeah. <laughs> that's got a bit more class there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what was the impetus for writing a book about communing with the ancestors? Well, you know, it's funny because it, it was never my intention to write the book. Um, a friend and fellow author, uh, Thorne Coyle, um, kept sort of nudging me to, to write this book, and I would always tell her whenever we met at a convention or whatever that uh, I didn't think there was a book's worth of material. You know, I said I could write a, a nice essay or something, but I said I don't really think there's a book's worth of material that hasn't already been, you know, discussed mm-hmm. and whatnot, and and she kept on it, and, and um, I've always been interested in the ancestral connection. It's always been part of my personal practice. Um, and there are several, you know, systems uh, in, in modern times and ancient times that that work with that. But it really became the idea that um, there was more to tell than than currently has been expressed. So I just sort of hunkered down and figured, okay, let's let's take this to the next step and see what happens. So. Um, it was really more kind of nudging something that uh, I probably would have written, you know, someday, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, Thorn Coyle helped it come uh, quicker. Well, as you note, uh, that your hand is guided when you write, but right. in this case you came to feel that you had to get out of the way as opposed to lending your hand in the writing process. Could you explain that a little? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I, I have 20-plus uh, uh, books in, in print, and all of them I've, I've sort of felt, you know, guided and directed. But this one um, was, was really quite different. When I sat down to write it, I, I had writer's block, which I never have, and I, I couldn't even get into the first chapter. And I was very frustrated, and I thought, well, I don't know what's going on here, but maybe I should just take a walk around the block and come back. And when I got up, I, I noticed a book on my bookcase that had a bookmarker sticking in it, and I never, I never leave books in that way on my shelf. So I went over and popped it open to see what it was, and it was a, a chapter on how um, we get in the way of divine communication. Mm-hmm. So I sat down and read that chapter, and um, I changed my attitude about writing, because normally I write from what I consider my personal knowledge of the subject, and then I try to embellish it and make it more interesting you know for the reader mm-hmm. but on this one every time i tried that it, it just wouldn't flow and finally um i lit a candle to my ancestors i put out the offerings and i said you know if you really want this book written i need some help and immediately that inner voice spoke very loudly and it said stop trying to write this book and let this book be written mm-hmm. and i went oh okay so then i literally would sit down each day without any idea of what I was going to write, and I would just open it up to the ancestors, and the book just sort of poured through in that way, and I became a student 
to the manuscript as it was being written, which was a, a new experience and a wonderful experience. Oh yeah, um, to to have that, and I was challenged in the writing of it. I mean, I would be typing things that I at first disagreed with, which was a an odd place to be, <laughs> you know, as a writer. And I would have to rethink that. And um, one day I got really frustrated, and I said, well, I don't want to backpedal or abandon anything. And that ancestral voice came back through instantly and said, you're not backpedaling or abandoning anything. You're just climbing up onto the shoulders of your ancestors for a higher perspective. And And that allowed me to relax and just let the book flow. And then you saw something written on a truck that convinced you that you should write this book. What was it? That was the pivotal moment. Um, my wife and I were sitting in, and actually in IHOP having breakfast, and uh, she was asking me, because we just had seen Thorn Coil you know, not long before, and she said, so what are you going to do about this book? And I said, there's nothing happening here. This, this, you know, I, I don't feel like the book is in me. I don't feel like the ancestors are with me. I don't, I don't really think, and I said, no, I'm, 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 I just don't think this is going to happen. And she goes, okay, you know. So we went out and got in the car, and well, before we started up the car, right in front of us, a semi drove parallel right in front of us, or perpendicular, right in front of us. And it had a, it was a giant white semi, and it had one word and one word only across the entire uh, back of that, uh, you know, side panel of that truck, and the word was ancestors. Mm-hmm. And I looked at her, and she looked at me, and we grinned, and she said, so? And I said, so I'm writing a book on the ancestors. Yeah, well, that, that's a good <laughs> And we looked all over that truck, and there was no phone number. There was no website, nothing. And when I got home, I Googled, you know, to see, you know, ancestor trucking, ancestor shipping. Nothing came up at all. Nothing at all, uh, huh? So well, I went, wow, that was really interesting. Yeah, I'll say. Yes. Well, <laughs> the message, I think, was loud and clear. Yeah, I guess I had to be hit by a truck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, who or what are the ancestors? Well, you know, that's interesting because the, the book sort of changed my view. I mean, logically speaking, the ancestors are those who came before us and, and have a connection to us uh, through our blood lineage. But there's a wider the ancestors, not only our ancestors. So there's a wider community. Um, but they really are kind of the old uh, beings that uh, pre-existed us and shaped our world, shaped our ideas, our views, and and um, they still dwell within what we call the living river of blood, which is the blood that flows through our own veins. It, it once flowed through theirs in a, in a DNA sort of reality, and that blood never stopped pumping, if you think about it, because each generation birthed another generation, and the hearts kept pumping the same blood lineage, you know. Mm-hmm. So we have this unbroken chain of ancestral connection all the way back to the first. Now, why is this topic important, and how is it relevant to these modern times? As if we're thinking it's modern times, right, anyway. Right, right. Well, you know, the ancestors have a vested interest in our survival, because through us they continue on conscious within our blood and um so they they want us to keep going and this world was once their world so they they do have an investment and a cherish uh cherishing of this this uh realm but we have collectively as a species uh cut ourselves so far from the wisdom and knowledge that our ancestors had you know these people that lived in common cause with nature uh, we we walked away collectively to a huge extent, and now we're we're in a world that is all about data and input and electronic gadgets and instant communication, and and it keeps us from the pulse of the earth. And we are, you know, you look around what's happening on the planet and politics and wars and just all the negativity on this world, and it is because. We are no longer connected to the natural environment to which we are born. Mm-hmm. So the ancestors, it's very important now, they're rallying here at the turning of the tide to communicate to us, to give us the old wisdom, to guide us back in the ways that are fruitful and healthy and beneficial and abundant, and um, to put an end to the, end, to the you know, 
um, the things in our blood that are bad that keep us separated. You know, you look at the wars that are going on, especially in the Middle East. You know, these are wars of generations of where people are fighting over lost boundaries and, bear, you know, uh, borders and whatnot, you know. And all this has to come to a stop, and the ancestors are speaking very loudly now. So you are seeing more books written about the ancestors, more workshops, um, archaeological studies. I mean, it, it does seem that they are rising to be heard. A lot of things are being reborn at this time. Yes. And I think it's very important that we pay attention to that. Uh, it is. Then you saw, no, the old, uh, I want to touch on this before we get too mm -hmm. much further, the old Scandinavian and Hawaiian views of the three selves are very close, you note, and mm -hmm. easily match up. Would you please talk to us about the three selves and what they are? Yeah, that was really fascinating to me. When, when I, the little bit of research that I had to do on this book, <clears throat> I wanted to go back to the oldest uh, concepts that I could find. And what I chose to do was look at the last um, cultures that were the, the last ones to fall to Christianity um, because they had survived the longest. And they happened to be the Scandinavians and the Hawaiians. The Hawaiians actually weren't uh, converted and um, their religion really wasn't, uh, you know, sort of uh, forbidden until the late 1800s, so that's quite late in the game. So a lot of that has survived. And then the Scandinavians, I believe, if I'm correct, I think that they didn't fall to Christianity until the 1100s or later. So there's a, a good thousand years and more um, when you look at these cultures. So I thought, well, let me go look at those. And I did, and I found that their concept of three inner cells was identical. They, of course, used different names. But um, it, it showed that they believed in a soul that was overseeing, you know, the being that we are. And then there was a human component and then uh, an elemental or sort of animalistic component. And that each of these three were self-aware and that they were in partnership with one another. And that really intrigued me Sure. Um, to, to look at that because... You know, we, we have this internal debate often when we sit and we try to figure out what we should do or what we did and we regret or what we fret about or hope to do. And I, and I stopped and I thought, well, who are we talking to? I mean, are we schizophrenic and just talking to ourselves or are there actually three beings that really we are communicating with and we're trying to get these three inner beings all on the same page? And so it, it came to me that that was true, that there really are three beings within us, um, that we have the human consciousness, which is the one you and I are using right now to communicate. Um, we have the elemental consciousness, which is the awareness of our bodies. That our bodies speak to us and demand things, you know, like if, they're, if it's cold, if it's hungry, you know, whatever. So it's always communicating as well. And then you have the soul which is really, truly who we are, the spiritual being that is in this dimension, who is using and working with these other two uh, beings to elevate them, and through them to gain awareness of things that can only be taught in a material reality. Uh, the lessons of material reality are quite different than the lessons in a spiritual realm, you know, in a realm mm -hmm. of non-material bodies. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And uh, I always pay attention to the Scandinavians, and they're quite a, quite a group of souls over yes. time. Whoops, well, we got a, a break coming up here on 21st Century Radio. Raven Gramasi, communing with the ancestors, your spirit guides, bloodline allies, and the cycle of reincarnation, wiser books. Hello, I am Selena Fox. I am Senior Minister of Circle Sanctuary, an international Wiccan church located near Barneveld, Wisconsin, and I'm Executive Director of the Lady Liberty League, which works for equal rights for pagans and others involved in nature religion worldwide. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. You can learn more about our work at www.circlesanctuary.org and www.selenafox.com. 
Tune in each week to Dr. Hieronymus' radio show so that you can stimulate your thinking, explore the mysteries of our world, and soar your spirit and imagination. Well, our guest is Raven Gramasi, and Communing with the Ancestors is the book that we're studying right now. It's a really good book. It's my introduction to ancestors. I haven't read any other material on this. Your Spirit Guides, Bloodline Allies, and Cycle of Reincarnation, Wiser Books, houseofgramasi.com. Okay. Do you know Selena? I do, yes. Well, she's, she's a real sweetheart. Yeah, I like her. Uh, so do we. <laughs> we like her an awful lot. <laughs> now, is there a difference between what we might think of as the dead versus the ancestors? Yes. Uh, this was something that was communicated to me through when I was writing the manuscript. Because <clears throat> I, I don't think I'd ever really broken it down. But as I was writing, it started to formulate. And that inner voice again of the ancestors um, said to me that the um, the dead are... People who someone still living knew. Um, the ancestors are are no one living today knew them personally, ever met them or spoke with them. So when when the dead are um, still dead and not ancestors, they are kept connected to the living because we remember them, we we talk about them, we knew them. You know, we may quote them or tell funny stories about them. So there's a there's a living link of energy that keeps the dead in a realm that is connected to the realm of the living. It's kind of like on the other side, um, on the veil, as people might say. Um, But the ancestors, nobody really knew them, so they don't have that connection to the living dead in the same way. I mean, somebody may have had a famous ancestor. They may be able to talk historically about them, but they never really knew them, so the living connection is not there. The living connection with the ancestors is in our blood. It's actually in the DNA that's been passed on through generations. So they are alive within us, and the voice is alive within us. But the dead are are a different, um, kind of in a different, uh, I guess I'll use the word dimension. Um, So that is the difference. The dead are connected to someone who's still alive that actually knew them. The ancestors are individuals who no one living today actually knew. Mm -hmm. Is it important to uh, talk about the dead or talk about those who have passed on, does it help in any way? Well, you know, the, the, both the ancestors and the dead can certainly aid us, and that is part of what they want to do. The limitations are that the dead are really who they were. You know, um, you don't die and then become instantly an enlightened being. You're still basically the person that just died. Um, and so you can turn around and... and comfort and try to direct and help and coach, you know, the living, you know, that that you were part of at that time. But you only have your individual wisdom or knowledge that was your life experience. Whereas with the ancestors, what you're getting is a collective consciousness. You're not getting the, the consciousness of one being, one dead person. You're getting the consciousness of all of your ancestors or all of the ancestors. And these ancestors collectively have experienced everything you could possibly experience in a lifetime and more. So they are more powerful in what they can aid you with and help you with uh, because of their collective uh, consciousness. Let me ask you, a, this might sound like a silly question, what is the importance of love? Of love? Yes. Hmm. Well, I think that love... You know, I mean, I've never really thought about this, but this is interesting. Um, I think that love is something that helps you be at the center and not disconnected from those around you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have love, you're open and and you have a higher vibration. And the way that you touch people is something of a higher resonance. You know, whereas if you're greedy or angry or you know, solemn or whatever it might be, you contract within yourself. You, you, you don't reach out. You don't connect to others. You, you can irritate other people, but you're not really giving. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah but I think yeah. with love, it's, it's a free-flowing signal, two-way street. Well, I've always liked the one phrase that 
concerning love is that it is the cohesive force of the universe. Mm, I like that. Does that sound decent enough? Yeah, yeah that sounds great. Yeah, let's buy that one. We're going to buy yeah, a couple of those. Let's get some bumper stickers and T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you got a great sense of humor. Now, in your book, you talk about reincarnation. Mm -hmm. How does this factor in terms of there being ancestors we can contact? Aren't they reincarnating, uh, though, the ancestors? Yeah, you know, that's, that's the, <clears throat> that was the problem. You know, I had never sorted that out before. And when I went to add reincarnation in, you rarely see that, <clears throat> pardon me, in books dealing with the ancestors, you rarely see anything about reincarnation. Um, so I, I went deeply into that, and the ancestors were explaining to me that the process is actually more complicated, and it's not that the ancestors are really reincarnating. Some do, but pretty much they fi finish their business and with, with material existence, and they are within the ancestral realm. Um, some of the dead, the personalities may reincarnate later on. But what they were telling me is kind of complicated, so I'm going to have to get a little wordy here and get a running start at it, if you don't mind. Well, we got plenty of time, so sure. Okay. Get so, so here it is. I'm going to simplify it, and I don't want it to be silly, but if I simplify it, it, it's easier to follow, but it's more esoteric than what I'm about to say. But look at it this way. You have a soul who is truly who we are, you and me and everyone. Um, and that soul comes from what I call the community of souls or the higher realm of the divine in which it was birthed. Now, in a spiritual reality or a realm of existence, it's kind of like the dream consciousness. You know, in a dream, anything's possible, everything's shifting and evolving. Um, there's no linear reasoning or thinking in a dream. For example, if you're in a dream and you're riding in your car and your car turns into a bicycle in a dream, things like that happen, yeah, happens, typically you'll just start pedaling the bike. You, you don't really have a major objection. You know, you, you might need to pick up a gun in a dream, and you pick it up, and it's a water hose. Next thing you know, you're watering your lawn. So you can't really learn from that experience, but you can, you can go with the images and the, the metaphors and whatnot, but you're not learning linear thinking. In other words, in a dream state, you can't build a chair because it would never allow you to do that. You would you'd turn into something else in the dream before the chair was ever built. So in the spiritual realm, it's like that. There's nothing cohesive. It's just the shifting of metaphors and images and whatnot. So to educate the soul, to give it balance, it must come into the material realm and learn this step-by-step -step process of creation. Here in the material realm, you can create a chair. There's a method, there's a formula, and it's consistent. It always works. That's part of educating the soul to be a whole being, to add the ability of, of creation and consistency and linear logic blended with metaphorical reasoning. When those two things come together, you have a whole being that can see both, you know, both realms, both worlds, and so it needs that. But in order to do that, it needs a physical body, what I call the deep-sea diving suit of the soul, Right? You and I wear them, and we explore this realm. It's called our, our bodies. So the soul dons this deep-sea diving suit of the soul to explore the material realm. But where does it get it from? And this is where the teachings started flowing in the book. The ancestors who are connected to the world of the living are also connected to what we call the elemental plane, which is the forces of creation itself. So they need, in each generation... They need an agent to represent their lineage, you know, their bloodline, because each bloodline, whether you're German, Italian, Greek, whatever it might be, that bloodline is, is sort of conscious and has a goal that it always is trying to achieve and accomplish. And each generation tries to accomplish that through all the people in that bloodline, but it's a slow process. So the ancestors need an agent. I'm an agent, you're an agent in this lifetime, to carry on the blood lineage um, so that that bloodline can, can complete its overall mission. So it says, and again, oversimplifying, but it says to the soul, I'll strike a deal with you. I know you need a body in order to continue your education. I need a physical agent in this world um, to further the ancestral uh, goal. So I will create a body 
out of the elements, the four elements here in the material plane, and you come in and animate that. And uh, together we can both reach our goal. So the soul descends at the time of uh, conception. The soul uh, descends to a, a cellular being that the ancestors have generated, and that becomes the fetus. Um, so that, that whole connection is really the process of, of obtaining the goals of each, the soul to have a body in which to educate itself further, and the ancestors having a living, living animated um, human um, to carry on the work. Where are souls born? Well, in the teachings, um, they're generated from from the divine process, not necessarily from the divine itself. Um, and I, I, I say that because probably 10 years ago, I would have said we are sparks of the divine, and we came directly from the divine. But the ancestors are telling me um, to look back at the old star god legends. They're the oldest that we have uh, in human memory. And these are beings that came down with bodies of fire. And um, they, in these oldest myths, the Mayans and all, you know, many of these uh, oceanic cultures still talk about them, they came down in bodies of fire and they created the first humans. So when I look at that mythos, if I try to tie that in and make that you know, more than just a story, then I would say that the divine itself created this race of fire star beings, some people might call them angels, um, are, are astral gods or stellar gods, and that through them, that divine spark was passed on to create us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the way that I personally look at it now. It doesn't negate the idea that we come from the great divine source, but it, it, it shows a little bit more of the, of the process. Or I don't want to say hierarchy because I don't really like that word. But it, it does sort of show the process of descent, which I think is important. So, would you say that all souls have a purpose, have a meaning? All souls have a mission. A mission, I'm sorry. And that That's mission right. is to educate themselves, mm -hmm. um, blending both realms, spiritual and material, so that they can then evolve beyond the need to return to the material plane, so that they can then uh, dwell in the realms that, that, they are, that are natural to them, which is the spiritual, non-material realms. So they have a mission to educate themselves. The human component, you and I, um, have a... Um, we are stewards of our bloodline. We are the living stewards of our lineage bloodline. We have the duty to move that lineage forward, to accomplish, to achieve, to do the best we can and to leave the world a little bit better behind us. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the lineage that we possess. And the work that we do and the things that we, we uh, achieve, the people we touch, the things we create, um, these are all the things that we as stewards advance the blood lineage uh, of our family uh, line. But the soul, tandem to that, is educating itself on everything we're experiencing. It's growing and learning and integrating that material knowledge, that lineage, that accomplishment, that achievement that's not possible in the spiritual realm because you can't build anything in a dream, right? right. So here you can, so they, they scoop up the knowledge of how to actually create and make it stay. Um, let, let me give you an analogy. Um, I, I was working, I had a, a teacher, who uh, R.J. Stewart, who was teaching me about uh, fairy connection, the old lore fairy connection. And in one of the exercises, um, I connected with what I believe to be this old ancient fairy being. And I was very enamored with it because I'm sort of a Lord of the Rings freak, you know. So I was very enamored with the idea of this fairy or elven being in front of me. And I could tell it was bothering the being. And, and he was basically saying, you know, well, what are you doing? And I said, I'm sorry, I'm just, you know, very taken with you because you're so magical. And he said, magical? He says, we're not magical. He said, you humans are magical. And I said, how are we magical? And he said, you are the only beings I know who can take a thought and make it become a thing, and that thing is still there even when you're not thinking about it anymore. Mm. I said, what? And he said, let me explain. He says, in my realm, if I need to sit, the need to sit will generate a chair out of the 
the astral fabric of my dimension, and I will sit as long as I have need for that chair. But when I rise and no longer have need for that chair, it's absorbed back into the material of my dimension. I'm not thinking about it anymore, therefore it's no longer available to me. He said, but you humans can create a chair that's always there, even when you're not home, even after you're dead. You take a thought and you make it a permanent thing, because that chair had to first be a thought before it was ever built. It had to be envisioned. It had to be drawn out. It had to be scoped in dimensions so the person could create it. So before it was ever a physical chair, it was a thought. And that thought eventually became a physical object. That's pure magic, yep. taking a thought and making it become a physical object. So that's sort of what the soul is doing. It's learning how to take the, the knowledge from this material realm and create something that will last in the spiritual realm. Well, we are learning that we must bow to uh, the money gods right now and take a break here on 21st Century Radio. Uh, Raven Gramasi is our guest. Hi, my name is Her Excellency Aina Olomo. I'm a Yorba priestess, and you are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Horonimus. Are you sitting up straight there, uh, Raven? Am I sitting up straight? Yeah, you, you know, your your feet flat on the floor, your eyes are straight ahead, and you're not chewing gum. Is that right? No, actually, I'm I'm sort of stretched out on the couch in front of a, <laughs> a fireplace without a fire. <laughs> well, that's acceptable. That's reasonable. Um, how does how does communication between the ancestors and us work? You touched on this a little bit earlier. Right. Well, there there's several ways. You know, the the old traditional way, of course, when you look at uh, various cultures that still to this day have ancestral veneration, you have you know essentially a shrine or an altar, and um, it's usually you know a daily thing or at least a monthly thing where you leave offerings, you light incense, you know, you meditate and you thank your ancestors, you know, for everything that. Uh, they did that allowed you to be, you know, who you are and what you are now. Um, and, um, you know, you sort of meditate with them and ask them for blessings. You know, that's, that's the basic approach. But it can go much deeper than that. Um, you can actually communicate directly through, uh, through your blood lineage with them. Um, and that can be done in, in different ways. One of the more, um, you know, I don't know, intense ways is actually too. Uh, sometimes you can take like a little needle and just sort of prick your finger and get a drop of blood and put that into a, a little cup of water. And what you're doing is you're making the blood, living blood connection back to the ancestors. Um, it reminds me a lot of there's an ancient writing uh, by Homer in which these Greek heroes, they, uh, they need to talk to someone who's dead who possesses knowledge that they need, and their um, Circe, this witch figure, sends them there with instructions. She tells them how to get there, but she says, when you get there, um, you'll find that the dead are mute. So what you need to do is you cut your hand, put a little bit of blood in a gourd, offer it to them to drink. Once they drink, they will remember being alive. And when they remember being alive, they will remember who they were in life. And when they remember who they were in life, they will remember how to talk again. So it's this ancient idea of this living blood connection that allows communication to be renewed, you know, revived again. Uh, a lot of people are squeamish about, you know, sort of pricking themselves or using, you know, body fluids in any way. But, you know, I point out that, you know, we, we bleed for various reasons all the time, you know, accidentally cutting yourself, you know, whatever it might be. So why not use it as a sacred thing, you know, as well? Um, so um, that that's one method. There are several rituals in the uh, the book several. that can show you how to communicate with your ancestors without having to do that. Yeah, you have many more than several. I mean, and that's what's so, also a very big plus for this book. Well, one of them, too, which I think is so important, and I don't know, maybe we would probably end up talking about that later, but it is the ritual of soul mending. Um, to me, when that was delivered in the writing of the book, uh, to me that was that was just really awesome because it's all about, you know, we as humans become estranged from people. 
um, we cut them off or we get cut off and, you know, we lose contact with them. And, and we think we're free of them, but we're really not because the, the Hawaiian mystics tell us that there's a, what they call an aka cord that connects you. It connects you if you dislike someone. It connects you if you like someone. It's an energetic connection to that person. And as long as there's energy, the aqua cord is always bound. So if you hate someone or you're hated by someone, you're still connected to them energetically, just like you are if they love you and you love them. So because the pettiness of humans will never allow that to be resolved, um, there's a ritual in the book which you can override the personality, the individual personas, the human part, and connect soul to soul. And the two souls agree. They say, hey, look, this is nonsense. Let you and I, on a spiritual level, dissolve the negativity here or reestablish communication, whatever it might be, um, because it is so important to remember that the soul is a very important part of what we are doing here. I'll say. You know, and, and a lot of people don't realize that. I mean, they go through life just sort of doing their thing, never realizing that we as humans are the, are the lesser part of the being, the complete being we are. Our souls are the, are the highest part, and they're really um, kind of running the show, or at least trying to influence us. Yeah, I wouldn't say running. I'd say more in trying to influence us um, through these feelings that we have about what we should do, shouldn't do. You know, I've had that many times in my life, and actually twice in my life. Had I not listened to that voice, I, I would have died. I've had two near-death experiences where it was a decision I made based upon what I was what was going on in my head, which I believe was my soul, that <clears throat> circumvented that uh, that happening. Would you like to elaborate on that death experience, near-death experience? Mm, well, it's a little embarrassing, but um, I'll tell one of them. I'm hard um, to Bear embarrass. in mind that I grew up in the 60s. Um, so I was, um, shall we say, someone who was not uh, um, shy about experimenting with mind-altering uh, substances. One day I was invited uh, along, I was probably 16, maybe 17, and I was invited to go with some friends, and they said that um, they, one of the guy's father was a dentist, and he had gotten a tank of laughing gas. And they were going out at night and in the car and turning on the laughing gas and getting high. And they asked me if I wanted to do it. Well, normally I was just you know, a typical idiot in the 60s. I would have probably said, sure, you know. But what happened was I immediately, this inner voice said, don't go. Don't do that. And I said, oh, you know, let me think about it. And they go, oh, come on, man. I go, oh, let me think about it. So they called me back, and I was still that voice was saying, don't go. And I told him finally, I said, no, you know, I just, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to go. I've got something else going on. So they went that weekend, and to get higher than they ever had before, they decided to roll up the windows in the car when they oh. turned on this oh. tank of laughing gas. Well, of course, the laughing gas consumed all the oxygen, and they suffocated to death. Oh. Oh. All five of them died in the car. And I'd have been in that car, probably. Uh, had I not listened to that inner voice saying, don't go, there was very out of my own head kind of a voice. Mm -hmm. And it was really adamant, don't do that. And um, that, that was one um, uh, of a couple um, incidences where that would have happened. Um, I, I'm trying to remember the other one was about a vehicle that, that crashed that I would have been on. Uh, but circumstances were such that I made a decision to, to, to change to a different mode of uh, <clears throat> transportation for no real reason, and it just happened, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I do believe we, we need to listen. We are being guided. We're not, we're not in this life alone. Well, I'm glad you uh, paid attention to your soul, and I hope mm -hmm. other people do the same thing. Uh, we're well, those getting... were crazy days in the 60s, you know, and uh, we did a lot of stupid things. But fortunately, I had someone looking out for me, and I was listening. Well, fortunately for myself, when I would, you know, my experience with rock and rollers, especially Jimi Hendrix and others, right. uh, we we never, we never got into that. When, when we and I got together, we never got involved in anything but talking about symbols. That's all okay. he wanted to talk about. 
He wanted to know about the pyramid and the eye and the triangle and what was it for. Mm -hmm. He knew that there was America had a spiritual mm -hmm. destiny, and he, he was right on top of it. And both of us had been studying this for some time. And we realized there really was a part of America we didn't know or understand. And that's why mm -hmm. I, I wrote the book, Founding Fathers, Secret Societies, to, to discuss what that, that material was. Cool. Yeah, that, that's exciting. Well, it was. It really, what it was, mainly because most people thought that uh, all he wanted to do was uh, get drugged up, and that's not true at all. Yeah, I know. That, you know, people get those kinds of uh, you know, legends attached to themselves, but... Uh, he never. You know, most creative people want to create, you know, rather than just be high. Well, the 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 media never wanted to ask him anything serious. Right. And this really would infuriate him, uh, because he wanted to talk about this. Sure. And uh, absolutely. And his wife, not his wife, but his sister, whom we're still close with and we still work with, um, knew and understood the importance of that. I'm sorry right. for for uh, going off the. All the off the path. Well, it wasn't totally off the path, but just partly there. Uh, sure. What? Oh, we got about three minutes. But what are the benefits for us in terms of being in communication with our ancestors? Um, they can guide you and steer you because of their collective knowledge. They can teach you inner healing. They can actually those who survived ailments that you are currently dealing with. They can guide you through and help you heal. Um, you know, they, they can support you in, in so many ways, teach you in your dreams. I mean, they're, they're, it's really unlimited as long as you listen to them. The benefits are, are, are bountiful. Yeah. By, by the way, where do ancestors dwell? I think we got enough time to talk about that. Yeah, that, that's a separate realm. It's a realm in what we call in between the worlds. It's not really in the material world, but it's not really all the way over into the spiritual realm. It's in between and that realm connects with what we call the elemental plane, which is the substance of earth, air, fire, and water, the elements that the ancients tell us were used to create all things. So the, they're sort of surrounded by this elemental plane, and through it they can create, um, you know, other, other, other humans. They, you know, they create the physical realities of our bodies. The they're end? in a separate realm, another dimension, close to this one, but not quite material. Do they, the ancestors, when they're together in that realm, do they communicate with one another? Yes, it is a collective consciousness. They showed me an image of a beehive. Oh. And to envision their realm as a beehive, you know, the bees are all mm -hmm. collected. They're individuals. Mm -hmm. But they think in a group way, and they're guided with a group consciousness. So their goal is more about the collective than it is about the individual. But the individual still functions and is present in that community. And that's what the ancestors are. And there's there's... There's ancestors who are older than others, and so they, they sort of are at the top, and they are the elders' wisdom keepers of the ancestral wisdom and knowledge. And then the other ones kind of work their way up, you know, almost like apprentices to that knowledge. But we can learn from them simply by opening ourselves up to communication and asking to be taught this greater knowledge. And with, with that, we got to take a break, and we'll be right back after the news. Our guest is Raven Gramasi. Communing with the Ancestors, Your Spirit Guides, Bloodline Allies, and The Cycle of Reincarnation, published by Wiser Books. Houseofgrimassi.com. I'm going to spell that for you. G-R-I-M-A-S-S-I.com. Are you with us, Raven? I indeed am. Okay. Now, you talk about, uh, a little earlier, you talked a bit, little bit about the Living River of Blood. Could you tell us more about it? Because this is a, mm -hmm. a, the the idea basically you know is sort of rooted in 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 science and metaphysics as well. If you think about it, you know you science you know you can dig up somebody who's dead and you know and uh, you know a couple generations back and if they can uh, get the DNA, they can actually say that you were born you know you were directly descended from that individual. So there's a marker in our in our body, in our blood, in our DNA that shows the lineage backwards in time. Um, I, when I first started writing a, a, a book called The Cauldron of Memory, which is about this topic of the Living River of Blood, I, I talked to people that work with DNA, and one of the things I wanted to know is in the body of my parents, was there bits of matter that were transferred to me 
you know, from them, and, and they said, yeah, because the, the DNA uh, uh, replicates. So you're getting a, a copy of it, and it's got everything that they had, so it's got the matter. And then I said, well, does it have the energy in it that, you know, was the life energy that connected all this uh, DNA spiral material together? And they said, yeah. And I said, so you're telling me that in my body I have the living um, bits of matter, I have energy that was in the bodies of my parents? And they said, yeah. And I said, so that would be true, then I would have their parents? Yeah, and their parents, and their parents, and their parents. And I said, yeah, I wouldn't argue with that. Um, you have within you bits of matter down to the micro, micro, microscopic degree of everyone that's come before you. So we, um, we have this living river of blood that's never stopped. If you think about this, I always give this analogy in workshops. You know, when uh, my parents... Um, procreated, you know, their hearts were beating, and then in the fetus, my heart began to beat. So the blood that was in them from their parents was flowing through them and now through me. And then when I um, had my daughter, her heart started pumping that same blood. None of these hearts stopped in the process. Mine was still pumping while hers began to pump. So that living river of blood has never stopped from the beginning of time. If you think about it, it's pretty profound. The idea that you and I have within us the living DNA of an entire lineage of people back to the very beginning and that we stand in a position called the steward, the living steward of that, that bloodline. And in the book I have some rituals that deal with the importance of that because you can correct negative energy in that bloodline by forgiving or releasing your ancestors because you are the steward that's a royal position in ancient times. It was uh, somebody that sat in for the king who was a steward. Um, so you could actually turn around and say, I forgive my ancestors for X, Y, and Z. And you actually release them from what might, people might want to call karma or, you know, bad energy or whatever it might be. Um, so it's, a, it's an important relationship. This living river of blood is nothing to be taken lightly. It, it's so profound that we have the living memory. You know, science is now finding out that we do inherit the memories of our ancestors. It's actually in our, you know, our bone marrow. It's in our DNA. Um, our phobias are there because of them. Um, you know, all of these things are talents. Sometimes you'll find someone who's who's six years old and they're they're um, writing symphonies. You know, and they're you know they're a master pianist. You know, where did that come from? You know, uh, their brothers and sisters aren't like that. There was something that awoke in their particular lineage, some ancestor, some connection where an ancestor actually arose within them and, and that launched that person in that direction. So that's kind of the living river of blood. And in magic, it's, it's um, in mystical work, I mean, it's, it's envisioned as though there's this river of blood flowing backwards in time and that your ancestors sort of uh, dwell on the banks of this river, you know, and then every now and then, you know, then again, this is all metaphoric. You know, they can they dive into the river or you dive into the river and meet. And you can commune through meditation. Um, and these are very old mystical ideas. So that the idea that we are all interrelated on this planet, one people, one planet, isn't so far removed. No, it, it isn't. You know, and that, that's the sad thing. You know, there there is so much more that unites us as human beings mm -hmm. than divides us. Yeah. But humans have always, unfortunately, been like that. You know, they they divide themselves into, you know, I'm from this city, I'm from this state, I'm from this country. Uh, this is my football team. This is my, you know, baseball team. You know, just hanging on to all the things that separate us. And I suppose that we think makes us better than other people. Um, but really, at the end of the day, um, we are much more the same than we are different. Yes, we certainly are. You know, and, and that's been shown, you know, you, you have people from different cultures, you know, they end up in a, in a situation, you know, in a foreign land or in a prison or whatever, it might be stranded on an island, whatever it may be, and they will come together eventually and work together, you know, despite their differences and cultural biases or whatever it might have, and, and they will work as, as, the one, as the oneness they really are. They'll rediscover that. And they'll, they'll, they'll get themselves out of that situation. Thank you. Or make it more bearable. I really appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Uh, what was the most profound experience you had in writing this book? 
Well, I, I, I kind of think the, the shock of having to, to at first disagree with what I was writing, I mean, that's an odd thing for an author to encounter. And I would be writing something, and I would, I would go, I'm not sure I agree with that, you know. And then I would, I would sit and think, you know, I'm, I'm pretty hunkered down in what I previously believed, and I'm more about evolution, so I really need to rethink this, you know. I really need to grow. And so I would, I would ask questions, and, and I would look and, and do more research and try to understand um, how my view was limited and what I needed to do to expand that view so that I wasn't really contradicting past books. I wasn't walking away from anything or saying that I was in error previously, but being able to say, no, you know, what it is is I've, I've, I've evolved spiritually and I'm, I'm seeing it in a much, a much broader view and from a higher perspective. What I saw before was valid from where I was at at the time. Um, but you can't stay put. The, the idea of spiritual evolution is not to stay who you were, even who you are. It's to grow beyond that um, so that you can be a better being for yourself and for others. You know, we're, we're not really here to entertain ourselves, you know. We're, we're here to really add to community, to add to the whole, to give our unique gifts and to support one another, you know, and, and, and I see this in, in so many small ways. It's like people come up to me, you know, at a book signing or a convention or a workshop or whatever, and they'll come up and they'll say, you know, I want to thank you for this book you wrote. You know, it really helped me, it really changed my life. It turned things around for me. And I'm really touched by that, the, the thought that something I wrote or said was helpful to somebody, you know, and, and, and changed them in some way that they – were able to overcome an obstacle or, or ease a depression or whatever it might have been. And the idea that, that anybody can do that for another human being is awesome. I mean, that's what we should all be doing, you know, rather than building walls and, 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 and separating ourselves and segregation and racial stuff and all this nonsense, um, is to realize that we are souls, and these souls that we are are our true beings. And they don't deal in the spiritual realm. You'll, you'll never encounter in the spiritual realm racism, sexism, you know, um, hatred. You know, that just doesn't exist in the higher spiritual realms. Um, but it is something here we need to deal with. I believe it's here to inspire us to climb above that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's not here for punishment or just to sort of wallow in the muck of it all. I think that our souls are to look at that and say, this is very distasteful to spiritual evolution. Let's correct this. Good idea. Now, oh, there's something I wanted to get back to in the bloodline that that has, uh, what if you come from a bloodline that has bad history of negative deeds? Does that cause problems? It certainly can, because it's in the bloodstream, you know, it's in the DNA, and it, it, it can put an energy upon us that we find in our own life is frustrating us, and we don't know why. We don't know why we keep ending up in the same situation, why we keep making the same mistakes, uh, why we're not getting anywhere, we're working really hard, but it's not paying off, you know. I think a lot of these have to do with these blood lineage blocks. And so I, I, in, in the book, I actually have a ritual to redeem the ancestors, it's called. And what you can do is clean that bloodline so that you liberate them, and by liberating them, you liberate yourself. You free yourself from the things that are holding you back and, and, um, and are necessary baggage. So I firmly believe that, um, that you can help yourself by redeeming those who have come before you. I had a similar, I had a situation with my father that brought that home in a very real way. Um, my father was uh, <clears throat> physically and emotionally abusive, so we weren't particularly close. And um, he died in a convalescent home. And um, the nurse called me that morning and said, I, you know, I'm, afraid, I'm sorry to tell you your father passed away. And I said, thank you. And I didn't expect to have any reaction to that, you know, because I had sort of scarred over a lot of that. But I went out into my, my patio, and I was kind of looking out and, And all of a sudden, I started thinking about him, and I thought, I wonder what you're experiencing now that you're dead with all the things you've done that were so negative. I wonder what it is you're experiencing now that you're free from the flesh. And all of a sudden, I just felt this 
funny feeling, and I heard myself say out loud to whatever's out there, I said, you know, if there's anything you need to do on my account for the soul, extract a pound of flesh or whatever it might be, I wipe that slate clean. On my behalf, you need do nothing. I wipe that slate clean, and I release him. And I'll tell you, I, I got this rush of energy up my spine and out of my body, and I felt 100 pounds lighter, and I think he did too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Because I... it was willful liberation. Does that make any sense? No, well, it certainly does. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of your book, reading, you, you, noting that. Oh, okay. Noting that. Uh, and also, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of wisdom in this book. Uh, I'm, I was so glad to see all the as above, so belows throughout, oh, yeah. because that's really important key in oh, all yes. of our lives. Yes. Now, Western culture. Oh, sorry. Break time on 21st Century Radio. Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody, author of Life After Life and The Last Laugh. And you are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Our guest is Raven Gramasi, communing with the ancestors, your spirit guides, bloodline allies, and psycho reincarnation. Wiser Books, houseofgramasi.com. You know, this is a very important book. So, well, let's get back to our guest, Raven, right now. Raven, you there? I am indeed. It's very generous of you. Thank you. Well, it's your karma. It sure serves you right. <laughs> now... Western culture typically views the serpent with negativity and uses its uh, form to denote danger or treachery. That is, what? well, what is the ancestral view of the serpent? Yeah, you know, the, that's one of the interesting things that happened because the, the further you go back in time when you study ancient cultures, the, the serpent is venerated. It's a symbol of wisdom. It's a symbol of protection. Um, it's also a symbol of ancestral connection. You will not find in any ancient culture, or even in the modern cultures that still venerate their ancestors, you won't find any that did not use the, the symbol of the snake. Um, even the ancient Romans, they have a serpent underneath the um, symbol of their, um, what they call the genus, the father of the lineage. You know, they have these little plaques in their homes. Um, so you, you find this idea of the serpent. It wasn't really until the Judeo-Christian concept came about that they did this Garden of Eden thing, and that's the first malignment of a serpent. That's the first role in which a serpent is depicted in a negative way. But the irony of that is it's not really that way in the story. It's the way that people talk about the story. Because in the story, the, the, uh, the serpent doesn't really do what modern people think. He's, he's, not, he's not trying to tempt. He's not trying to force anything. He's just pointing stuff out. And Eve you know, falls into her own desire, uh, and then she, she does something that she wasn't supposed to do. But, but the serpent's not egging her on. He's not like, oh, come on, you want to, you know, come on. He just simply says, you know, what's the deal? And she says, well, we can't eat from this tree. And he says, why is that? And she says, well, because God said when we eat of that tree, we'll, we'll die. And he says, oh, you won't die, but you will have your eyes open and you know the difference between good and evil. Mm-hmm. So she thinks that's a pretty good deal. So she eats, and sure enough, she does not die, like he said. But her eyes are open, and she knows the difference between good and evil, and this angers God. But the serpent didn't really do anything other than tell the truth. Indeed. So it's kind of weird that the story, you know, is twisted, because if you just read the, the Genesis Genesis verses, he's not doing anything that modern people will tell you about that story. That's true. Um, so people have maligned the serpent, but ancient cultures venerated it, and I use it in the book because um, there's an entity that I call the, the serpent writer, or spirit writer, serpent writer. Um, and this is a very important thing that shows up in pre Christian culture, uh, especially among the Mayans. The Mayans have a a remarkable mystical tradition, uh, very ancient. And they have this one thing called the vision serpent. And what would happen is whenever the, uh, the kingdom was in um, turmoil, they would turn to the ancestors for guidance because the ancestors have the collective knowledge and wisdom. So the high priest would uh, take a bowl and he would put some dried bark in it. He would cut... Uh, part of his body and put a little bit of blood on the bark and he'd light it on fire and in the smoke he would see this vision serpent rise up 
And the vision serpent would open its mouth, and out on its tongue would walk one of the ancestral spirits. And the high priest would tell the spirit what their problems were and ask for help. The spirit would turn around, go back down the snake, and deliver the message to the ancestors. And then the ancestors would come back in serpent form and deliver the solution. This shows up among the Mayans, but it also shows up among the Hawaiians. Almost the same deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, The difference is that when the ancestors sent the wisdom serpent into the Hawaiians, it actually entered their body um, and in their religion and you know, religious belief system. It would enter their body and, and come up and sort of fill in the spinal area. If you look at the spine uh, of a human in a skeletal way, that spine does look like a snake. It sure does. And so the snake would sort of cuddle into that and, and, and then deliver the information um, to the person. So I have a technique using that ancient uh, method and uh, the spirit writer in, in which you actually have the spirit of your ancestors. You call it into your own being, and you meditate with it, and you, you ask it to help you. And then it also helps you look back in time to see the purity of the world before we, we kind of messed with it. So what that does is it helps us internally reboot, if you think about it, we can actually reboot ourselves physically, mind, body, and spirit, by by having that sort of serpent awakening, the ancient idea uh, of uh, the benefits of the ancestral uh, serpent. And, you know, they used to, in days of old, in the storage bins for the grain of the harvest, you know, rats would come and eat the grain, so they would put snakes inside the storage bins to kill the rats. So the, the snakes became protectors of seed also. So if you think about that, it's almost protectors of the next generation, isn't it? Yes, of course. Yeah, so this is the way that when you work with the serpent spirit, you're working with a positive being, very ancient, pre-Christian, who is actually the uh, protector of your own seed for the future. Um, So it all ties together. It's interesting how this can all be woven back. And that's kind of my mission. I mean, that's kind of what I try to do with all my books. I'm what I, I call a root tender. I go back to the roots of it all, and I nourish the roots so that the roots can nourish the new growth, you know, the new leaves and stems and all that, you know, metaphorically speaking, the new traditions, the new ways of thinking. But if you don't have the roots feeding the newness, then the newness can't grow, it dies. Are you a gardener? Yes. Well, I mean, I garden. My my wife actually is the gardener extraordinaire. <laughs> but I do uh, grow plants that are important to my spiritual practice. Well, it sounded that way to me. Yeah. Now, there are other, you also do a real good job on kundalini. Would you, this is another highly misunderstood mm. concept. Talk to us about what kundalini is and what yeah. it isn't. It, it comes from um, uh, Eastern mysticism versus Western. And the idea is that we have a vitality within us, which has been symbolized again by the serpent, a very ancient, venerated symbol, nothing negative about it whatsoever. And they envisioned that it it coiled itself in the genital region of, of humans, and that all of our energy, sexual procreation, uh, was also channeled into our creativeness, our work, our, our art, our passions were all generated from that center where the serpent slumbered. And the idea was to awaken the kundalini, they called it. The kundalini, I, I believe, means the coiled one, which is the snake. Yeah. Um, so it sits in the tailbone area. And oddly enough, in science, if you look at the tailbone, there actually is a little fiber that spiral that sits inside of the tailbone. I'm not sure that the ancients knew that. Um, But anyway, um, so they would do these techniques of awakening the serpent and having the serpent try to rise up through your body, again through the spine, and enter into your mind, your consciousness, and awaken itself in the fiber of your your mind so that the energy of your being was, was delivered to your mind to be able to use for creative, um, even divine expression, and the interesting thing about that is when you look at the uh, ancient pharaohs who were the kings of Egypt, they were considered to be divine by the people of Egypt. And if you look at their headdress, right on their forehead is the head of a cobra. 
So it's as if the Kundalini spirit made it all the way to the consciousness of this being. He was therefore now semi-divine. Um, so it's really interesting when you look at spirit symbolism and this mind-body-spirit connection, um, but it requires that you step away from the malignment of the serpent, the fear of the serpent yeah. that came with the rise of Christianity, and real realize that, that that was never really part of, of anything associated with snakes. Thank you. Boy, I really appreciate that. Oh, by the way, how does healing factor into the ancestral communication? How does it factor in? Yeah. Well, um, many of the disorders we have um, come from our DNA. They come from people who had these disorders, whether it be a predisposition to cancer, to, you know, uh, certain uh, uh, deformities, whatever it might be, uh, conditions. Um, those are still in our DNA, unfortunately, and we can awaken those or have those awakened accidentally, and then we come down with that condition. So the advantage of working with the ancestors is coming back collectively to them, to the majority that did not have that condition, and actually have them work to turn that signal off to reverse the, the disorder, the dis-ease of the DNA body, the dis-ease in the living river of blood, and reboot it so that the wave comes back to healthy DNA, healthy cells, regeneration. And we see that in interesting ways, you know, because some people will have cancer and then, you know, they're just starting treatment. They really aren't you know, doing much, and then they get a little checkup and it's completely gone. And, the, and the, the, the oncologist is going, I don't understand how that can be gone. And, again, I think that there is spontaneous healing that can take place within the body. And it isn't random. It isn't a fluke. It's, a, it's an ancestral um, reawakening. The ancestors have redeemed you from that, uh, I believe. And we can ask them to do that. I think that's part of the healing process that's been ignored. Well, I think if we could bring that in hand-in-hand in hand with modern medicine, I think we would see profound changes. Yes, we, sure, we surely would. Uh, there are other fascinating things within this book. And I, I got to ask you this question. <laughs> Scientists have discovered new stem cells dubbed, and mm. now I'm going to mispronounce this, but I'll try. It looks like to me endometrial. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Re yeah, endometrial uh -huh. regenerative cells in the right. menstrual blood of women. Yes. How are they unique? Well, you know, that's the interesting thing. They, they actually... Um, they actually can become other cells without losing the integrity. With regular stem cells, uh, I'm not a scientist, but you know, I've read up on it. With other stem cells they're like, that you take from other parts of the body, there, there's a problem with their stability or with, with sometimes when you change them, you don't really get the purity of, of what that other cell should have been. You know, I, I'm not real educated on it, but this is what I understand about it. But those particular cells you just mentioned are, are like super cells in which that doesn't happen. And they are the mother, literally the mother cell from the womb um, that can really generate um, these really powerful um, replicas. They can become the purity of a new cell. Like they can become a cell in the brain. They can become a cell in the liver, a cell in the spleen, and be successful and whole uh, as that cell. So that, that's very profound, whereas the other stem cells, there are, there are problems in making it become something else and be, be stable at the same time. I know there was a theory, some theories by Barbara Ann Clow dealing with the use of menstrual blood and other, other procedures of healing, mm -hmm. and that's generally not discussed. Right. Uh, but I, I, the last time I talked about that uh, was with her, gosh, 20-some years ago. Boy, time right. flies. Uh, but, and, I, and I really don't quite understand a lot of that, but it's just absolutely fascinating to realize that there, within our body, uh, mm -hmm. s such things as, as menstrual blood, which may be offensive to so many other people, ends up being something powerful to posit use in positive ways. Oh, uh, absolutely. It's the same alignment with the serpent. 
You know, they, they took something once sacred, and women's menstrual blood used to be sacred. It, people were anointed at altars with it in ancient times. It was sprinkled on, on plowed land to ensure fertility of the crops. You know, I mean, it was, it was uh, some serious stuff. Yeah. And, but when, we, when the matriarchal system rose and suppressed women, sexuality in particular, they also suppressed that. And, and then with the rise of Christianity, uh, women were, were seen to be lesser and, and and their role in society was diminished, and that wasn't true in, in really ancient times at all. And the church is really responsible. You know, so, yeah, you know, unfortunately, it's a malignment of, of the feminine power. Yeah, yeah. Well, the church is really responsible for that. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, it was part of the conversion process, you know, to to convert people over to Christianity. They had to make the prior religions look negative, and a lot of the prior religions were empowered by priestesses, and so that became an issue. And then the New Testament really focused on the idea that women shouldn't be allowed to teach, they shouldn't be preachers, priests, you know, they shouldn't be involved in the church as, as teachers and, and ministers, and, you know, they were really diminishing their role and importance. I think part of that was to take away from the previous religion and change the game over to what made your Pay, uh, yeah, to make us a... wanted. That was the man in charge of everything. That's right, and that's where we, we've had one war after another, because mm-hmm. uh, women know how to resolve problems like that very much, much more differently than men do. Right. It's, well, it's yeah, not women a, communicate differently than, than men, and then that communication is, is much more social and resolving, I think, you know, when you sit and, and listen to women talk. I'm surrounded by a lot of women, and, and when I sit, sit and listen to them talk, and then I think about times I've sat and listened with a bunch of guys or I've been involved in the conversation. It's quite a different way of communicating. Sure. It sure is. Uh, I think we're getting up close to another break right now, but I cannot see my producer. So we're, we're, go, we're moving on here. We're breaking <laughs> rules and regulations here, but it's not my fault. <laughs> uh, so why, why we got this little bit of time right now? Who are the watchers? Oh, boy, yeah, that, that gets uh, a little tricky. Um, there are so many ways of looking at that, but most people look at it based upon who Hebraic mysticism, in which the watchers are a group of angels uh, who are high-order angels who were sent down to earth in ancient times. This is sort of biblical. And um, they're, they were supposed to do one thing, but they decided to do something else, and they intervened in human evolution, and they taught humans how to be more skillful Mm -hmm. than apparently, you know, God had wanted them to be, according to the legend attached to the story. So these angels became vilified, and um, they were thrown out of heaven in the old story. So they were kind of maligned for trying to do what they thought was best for humankind, and then they became sort of these fallen angels. And that's one view of them. In other views of them from other cultures that aren't Hebrew and therefore not tied to the Bible, they are a sort of a celestial race. They are a higher race of beings who watch and observe humankind and try through, through energetic communication to better the lot, you know, to better our situation, to, to keep us focused on higher goals of evolution and, and working to change and be better. Um, and that's that. That's a view that I prefer to look at the Watchers as a race of a spiritual brotherhood or sisterhood, if you will, a kinship. Um, they don't intervene, though. They don't come in and actually make things happen, but they try to get us to see what we need to do. And then it's our choice whether we want to do that or, or climb back into the mud pit. Well, I really want to thank you for uh, mentioning Gerald Massey. And uh, uh, there are some names here I haven't seen for 20, 25 years. Yeah, the older material, and I love the older material. It is. It's the best. It's the best. We had, we went through a period of, of watered-down New Age teachings that that certainly uh, were pretty flimsy. But we got to take a break here right now with our guest, Raven Grimalsi. Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. Karen Tate. I'm the author of Goddess Calling, Inspirational Messages and Meditations of Sacred Feminine Liberation Theology, and the radio show host of Voices of the Sacred Feminine Radio on Blog Talk. My website is www.k 
karentate.com. And you've been listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. I hope you'll read my books and discover why the spirituality of the sacred feminine is today's new liberation theology, setting us free from the domination and exploitation of patriarchy and how that patriarchy has kept women and men from achieving their fullest potential. I couldn't agree with Karen Tate more. Um, you know, men have uh, done a terrible job. <laughs> We've done a terrible job. Let's face it. However, we're, we're getting better all the time. Yes, we are. At least I'm trying to get better all the time. And I and I already know that uh, Raven, he doesn't have to worry about stuff like that. Right, Raven? He's, he's, already, <laughs> he's already better all the time. I'm, I'm better because I'm surrounded by women. Well, that helps. It sure, <laughs> sure as hell helps. And, you know, that was the advice I received from when I, I asked my friend, uh, who was the mayor at the time, William Donald Schaefer, who then later became governor. I asked him once... Uh, Don, look, how can I become successful? What is the secret? He says, I'll I'll tell you what the secret is. He says, it's simple. Surround yourself with the most intelligent women, and the rest is easy. Mm. And he was right. He's right. Mm -hmm. I've got an executive producer who has about 400 IQ, uh, and uh, they got uh, other people around me that who have IQs that are similar, and they're all women. Yeah. And it has really made a difference in my life. Uh, Absolutely. So he he was right, and I'll give the governor. Uh, and <laughs> he was a pretty tough guy, though. I'll tell you that. Yeah. And I bet you a lot of listeners out there who know about the the governor don't would have never believed his entire. He had an entire life, spiritual life. And mm-hmm. it dealt with he loved Egypt. He believed he was reincarnated. What am I talking about this guy for? Well, he's a great guy. <laughs> All right. So, you know, well, we I had think, a though, part of it, you know, is, is um, you, you can gain more balance with your masculinity, you know, when when you're also enveloped in, in the feminine modes of communication. Um, I think it really helps a man become more balanced in his own masculinity. And I think that that's a positive spiritual thing. Yeah, pa- balance is the key to everything as far right. as I'm concerned. And I'm biased. At least I tell people I'm biased anyway, because I am. Now, we have been called back into physical life for a purpose. Can listening to the ancestors reveal that purpose? Yes, indeed. I, I think, again, through through the deeper connections, using the rituals in the book, um, you can find ways of really direct communication, you know, to where you really can confirm that you're being communicated with rather than just having it be faith or a belief. Mm-hmm. Um, you can actually experience it. And they, they can help you um, kind of redesign where you're going and, and find out really what your purpose here is and what it is you're supposed to be accomplishing as the steward of the living river of blood of your own bloodline. Um, that, that's huge. But also in that, because you get back on track, um, you then also better communicate with your soul, and uh, your your soul is is making the journey more um, aware. Well, this this question uh, you touched on a little bit before. You note that there are older races on Earth before the reign of humankind, mm-hmm. and you touched on the fairy race, but you only uh, did a couple of seconds on that. Could, yeah. could you tell us about these beings? Yeah, you know, it's funny, when you when you start to study them, you know, today's idea of fairies, and when you talk about fairies, everybody thinks you're kind of cuckoo these days, because they're thinking about Disney fairies, they're thinking That's about right. fairies in children's books, you know, mm-hmm. sitting on little flower tops and that type of thing, or Victorian age kinds of fairies. But when you really study fairy lore and you go way back, these are incredibly ancient beings. They, they pre-exist humankind. Um, they are... Um, much wiser, much more knowledge and skilled. Uh, their their intellect is beyond anything we can imagine. And they, for a while, they had interactions with humans. They explored this realm. And a lot of our ancient lore and, and uh, tales comes from misunderstandings about these beings. Um, because they're not human. They don't think in human ways. And so when we first contacted them, 
you know, we felt that they were dangerous because we were applying human standards to them. And that's one thing that, that is really an error. And I think about that in terms of the one day that we may end up uh, connecting um, with encountering aliens from other planets. We've got to really be sharper because we can't use our human ideas and concepts as the standard for a positive life form when we encounter beings from other planets. Because these beings may be so totally different from us that we would misinterpret them as being negative when they really aren't being. It's, it's mm -hmm. us that aren't understanding them. And I think that happened with the fairy race. Eventually, I think that they got tired of having to deal with us, and they withdrew back into their own realm. Um, they are on the other side. They are stewards of the other side of reality. Um, and uh, one thing that's happening now, my fairy teacher said to me, um, that because of the, the damage we're doing to our own planet, there's a ripple effect upon the dimension of the fairies, who are just literally connected to us energetically, dimension to dimension. So that ripple is contaminating their realm, and so they're now coming back. So there's lots of fairy contact happening again. There's fairy teachers are showing up, and they're coming back, and they're literally saying to us, from all the fairy teachers, they're literally saying to us, fix this here in your realm, or we will if you don't. And if we have to do it, it's not going to be beneficial for you. So get your act together. You're affecting other worlds. You're affecting other dimensions by destroying your own. Clean up your act. We'll help you, but don't make us do it for you because you won't like that. Really? And that was a harsh message when my fairy teacher delivered it to me. I was like, oh, geez, you know. Um, but working with the fairies, as I do, um, that's not really where they're coming from. It's not really a threat. It's just a fact. They're just saying, you need to do this. If we do it, it will be in such a way that it will benefit us more than it will benefit you. So we're giving you the opportunity, and we'll help you correct things here. But you've got to participate. You've got to participate in your own existence fully. Uh, do the, do the uh, fairies... Oh, I'll get this right. Fairies have dreams. Do they dream? Well, I've never really, you know, had that sort of conversation with one of them about whether they dream or not. But mm -hmm. um, I, I would suppose they have something equivalent to that, some type of, of vision. I, you know, it's not really something I've spent my time working with them on. When I work with them, I'm more focused on what I need to do. What can you teach me? What techniques, what empowerment can I use? How can I change things here that are negative? What, how do I work with you to do that? You know, so I'm more focused on those kinds of things um, than I am on trying to figure out their their, their social order. Well, I, we're running almost running out of time, but I've got to ask. This is my uh, favorite question. Okay. Okay. Our ancestors had a more other world notion about trees i really enjoyed this within your book what was it share with yeah. us what what you know you're talking about trees trees yes yeah trees are amazing beings and science is just catching up to realizing that they are sentient self-aware and more importantly they are communal beings it's not survival of the fittest um, they are communal beings and they communicate through the root system and they use uh, colonies of fungus um, as kind of neurotransmitters. It almost looks like the brain when they show images of it. The neurotransmitters in the veins in the brain look exactly like the root systems below the surface. And these have become ways that beings in days of old communicated to humans through trees. Um, and uh, our ancestors ended up venerating and worshiping trees. And when you look at the oldest lore, gateways into the fairy realm were often through the hollows of a tree. You'll see it in modern drawings. There's a hollow or doorway inside of a tree, yeah. and that was a way in. So they, they have been kind of mediators for us between the worlds. They still are. Um, science has learned a lot about how they communicate, and they create pheromones that they release as gases from their leaves, and that's how they communicate with themselves and with other beings. And while I was reading one scientific study that they were saying the reason that humans come back refreshed from camping in the woods isn't because we've been away from work. It's because the trees responded to our intrusion 
our energy. We came in to change the vibration by being humans, set up our camp and did all of our stuff. The trees responded by trying to restore the ener- the resonance to what it was before we came in. So they created pheromones that they released from their leaves, and they tranquilized us with these chemicals. Mm. And so we became relaxed and mellowed out, and we felt better. So the trees are actually sort of saying, chill out. You know, you're, you're too hyper. You, you can build your tents and do your games and run around splashing the lakes and stuff, but chill. And so they they released the pheromones to calm us. So that's communication. That's awareness of us. It's communication. It's helping, too. You know what I mean? It's, sure. it's helpful. They weren't harming us. They're helping us. Mm-hmm. And um, more and more we were discovering through such biologists as Rupert Sheldrake that all plant life is aware and sentient and communicates, and it's aware of us. And, uh, you know, in days of old, the, the plant uh, people, the pharmacute, uh, the old witch people, the village healers, they all used plants to heal. They, they knew the medicine both spiritually and physically. So we really need to rethink the greenwood. We really need to rethink how we look at vegetation on this planet. And we really have come to an end tonight. And I'm awfully sorry for that. I really enjoy this. Uh, I think you've done a, a masterful piece of work here. Well, thank it's, you. I it's, really appreciate it's that. going to help a lot of people. It really is. Well, friends, we'll be seeing you next week on 21st Century Radio. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. And I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus. And remember to sit up straight.